And um, so now uh, we are going to immediately transition into our next event, which is the Monero Coffee Chat, essentially. This is our special edition for Monero's anniversary, the monero -versary. And so I'm going to uh, do some quick introductions here with people who um, are available. Let's start with the other Monero Core team member who is with us. Let's start with Arctic Mine. Arctic Mine, can you introduce yourself for us, please? Um, you may have to unmute yourself. Can I be heard? Yes, we can hear you. And I've advised that we have binary fade on too, so we'll get to him right after you are. Okay, sounds excellent. Uh, any issues with audio, connectivity, etc.? Nope, it's a lot better than last time. Yeah, everything sounds great. Go uh, ahead. Good. Okay, excellent. Well, um, my, like I said, I'm a was involved in the with the core team since uh, 2016. So I was one of the initial um, members of the core team. Um, I got involved with Monero in uh, 2014, essentially as an investor, um, and then spent a lot of time doing research on certain aspects of, of the project. Um, my background is physics and mathematics. I did my degree in physics, it's a PhD, and mathematics, uh, and I've also done a lot of investing I work a lot in the nonprofit area. Um, and so my main interest in the project, which is interesting, is something a lot of people really don't associate with Monero, which is scaling and on-chain scaling. So that's the <laughs> in the project outside of being involved in the core team, which is totally separate. I mean, working on block size scaling algorithms and how you're supposed to price these things and so on. It's really totally independent. It's analogous to what Ricardo was mentioning before. Um, another comment I'd make, I've been in the core team, I, I will summarize the core team at this point, is that it serves at the pleasure of the community, which is kind of a, sort of a touching on what Ricardo had said. Um, so there is, we, we sort of basically have, you have to get a sense of what the community wants um, and where it's heading and, 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 and what's expected. And that's a very important element of it. Um, so that's kind of where I am, uh, in my, you know, my background, I've been involved for, I guess I primarily as an investor, and then I did a lot of research, and then the results of that research um, actually applied back into the community. All right, thank you, Arctic Mine. So You're very welcome. <laughs> on to the third uh, Monero Core team member, how about we have Binary Fate introduce himself to everyone here? All right. Binary Fate, are you available? <laughs> Looks like he was in the back. He's, he's running. You can see him in uh, one of the other what, one of the other panels running to the screen. Okay. Go ahead, Binary Fate. Okay. Well, we can come back to him. I can see him at the computer. So feel free to interrupt us um, at any point to do some quick introductions. Instead, let's move on to the totally magnificent Ravrar, go ahead. Hi, I'm Ravrar. My name is Diego Salazar. Uh, I do things uh, in the Monero community. I, oh wait, no, there's Jeremy, and he's he's cooler than I am. So let's. I, I will. No, you, you should finish, and we can move on to Jeremy. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, so <laughs> I, I do some web work stuff. I do some. Uh, geez, uh, I. I I, I try my best to keep spirits high in Monero and to make jokes that aren't funny so people can pretend to laugh at them. Uh, and really anything I can sink my hands into in terms of community work. Uh, I'm a UI UX person and I, do, I try to do a lot of behind the scenes UI UX work because open source sucks with UI UX, um, cryptocurrency suck in general with UI UX and Monero really sucks with UI UX. And th that's just the way that it is. Uh, I'm trying my best to make that a, a, a different story, but this is the story that we have right now. And it, I mean, it's not Monero's fault. There's just a bunch of nerds working on it that don't know anything about design, but that's okay. That is okay. We love them for who they are, right? So um, I just, you know, anything I can stick my hands into, sometimes a core team gives me something to do and they'll say, hey, Diego, can you do this? And I'm like, yeah, it's, uh, yeah I'll get that done. Because um, uh, they, they don't, uh, as they mentioned, they don't really do anything. So <laughs> so I do this stuff. Uh, but that's, that's, 
that's me. That's what I do. And I go on long rants and you'll hear a rant from me later on. Justin actually scheduled a specific time for me to give a rant today. Uh, and it'll be like 45 minutes long and you all are in for a treat, let me tell you. But I'm gonna, for now, I'm going to give the floor and the microphone away before I talk too much and get into one of my ants preemptively. So bye-bye. Yes, thank you, Diego. We specifically scheduled time for Diego to have a rant. So that way we can keep it outside of the coffee chat time and we can still talk to others. Okay, let's give it another try. Binary Fate, can you introduce yourself to us, please? Yeah, can you, can you hear me? We can hear you now. We can't see you, but we can hear you. And that's what's important. I disagree. Binary Fate is a beautiful man and I would love to see him. It's possible. Yeah, we're trying to fix that. Yeah. Uh -huh. There we go. There we go. Ah. Oh. <laughs> hey. You're beautiful too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Justin, what do you want me to talk about? <laughs> At first, let us know who you are. Yeah, so uh, Benary Fest, um, member of the Monero core team. I'm involved in Monero, uh, both with the actual project and then with the ecosystem from very early on, um, because I was in, you know, doing stuff in cryptocurrencies out of uh, personal interest from a technical or ethical perspective, even before Monero. And then when Monero came up very quickly, it was just like a match in heaven for me. Um, but I was also very interested to build businesses and uh, make a living in that domain. And this is what I've been trying to do with Monero as well. And um, I I'm, believe in a, um, in a dynamic where businesses can actually build on top of open source projects and then in return actually fund or donate back to the open source projects so that there is a way for projects that at first are um, disinterested or you know don't have uh, any financial interest like Monero uh, to actually get sufficient funds to pay people that needs actually uh, funding to work on, on the project full time or where they can do it like that. So I'm, I'm, I was blessed to uh, create businesses that could give back to Monero uh, to fund various um, uh, foreign funding system and now crowd, community crowdfunding system. I came up with that name, but I, I still struggle to, <laughs> to, to say it. I'm sorry, Diego, I know you didn't like the name. That's my fault. Anyway, we'll have to stick with that for probably a decade now. Um, anyway, uh, so that's what I was doing like in my professional life, which is to do to develop business on top of a layer in which I believe and try to give back to that, uh, to that layer, which is Monero. And then on, on the personal side, uh, try to contribute, contribute what I can as a uh, member of the community first and, and then as a member of the core team. Uh, I'm, sure you're, I'm sure you're trying to introduce uh, the brand new uh, website you announced earlier today. So would you like to mention that again here? Yeah, so um, I had a very short night yesterday and, and actually a bunch of short nights uh, in the last days uh, because we were trying hard to push to actually release uh, today, which was tough, work, but we made it. Uh, so it's uh, it's called minco.io. It's a gambling website. So it's a game uh, that is probably fair. And uh, it's actually really fun because you can, you know, even if you're not into gambling, you can really see that the, the actual network and the, the software is working so well. So you can just go to a meetup and use that to uh, demonstrate that when you send a transaction, you actually see the result in just like seconds. Um, so I think it's great also to introduce newcomers. Um, but uh, the, the, the idea, yeah, in general, of course, it's a business. You know, it has, it's not related to the actual core team. Uh, but for the first month, we will donate the entire profit to the Monero General uh, Fund that the core team then uh, uh, administer. And uh, we will most likely continue you know, giving donations long term after that, we, we have to find the good model. We have to also to see 
uh, what traffic and volume we get to take that decision. But for now, basically, it's a cool game. You can go to minco.to and either you get money, you earn money if you win, or if you lose, you are effectively making a donation to Monero. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah. I think we all should have brought our own uh, audience applause background riffs. Um, anyway, thank thank you so much, Binary Fate, for introducing me. <laughs> all right, uh, Sarang, can you introduce yourself to everyone here, please? All right, can you hear me okay? We can't hear you. Hey. I've had perpetual problems with Jitsi, but it's apparently working today. So uh, my name is Sarang Nother, um, and I am one of the uh, two full-time researchers with Monero Research Lab. I actually started with Monero um, back like in the pre-Ring CT days in grad school, just kind of doing part-time work for uh, Ricardo, Fluffy Pony, um, on doing some kind of just initial review work, and then kind of, uh, kind of slowly like let that kind of slide to the back burner. And then after grad school, I uh, joined up again full-time with Monero Research Lab. And uh, now that's what I do, completely supported by the community. Um, I, along with uh, my counterpart, uh, Brandon, who is a uh, Saray Nother, um, we do protocol analysis and design and feasibility testing. Uh, we do security reviews. Uh, we write papers, have meetings, all sorts of things. So I guess I kind of like to say that we do math so that you don't have to. Um, and part of our goal is to try to make Monero as it currently is, as safe and as private as possible. Um, and another goal that we have is to kind of figure out what's going to be next for Monero and figure out how to take things that are done in the cryptographic space kind of more academically and see what's feasible to bring into Monero um, kind of from a practical perspective. So we do a lot. And I personally am super thankful for um, the amazing community that we have. I mean, nothing that we do could be done without the support of the amazing Monero community. Okay, thanks again, Sarang, for having you on. It's always a privilege to work with you on things like the Breaking Monero series. Uh, I want to point out that Sir Ray Nother Brandon um, unfortunately couldn't make it with us because he's currently at Clemson speaking about how he made Monero more secure. So he's doing his actual job right now rather than just sitting in a like sitting in front of a camera, unfortunately. Uh, so I'm sure we'll be able to speak with him some other time. We're trying to get together and have more Breaking Monero episodes in the future. All right, need money ninety. Your turn. Hey, uh, I'm Need Money 90 I'm a moderator in the community, among other things. Uh, if you've been banned or censored, I'm probably the person that you want to be looking at. Uh, so at the end of this uh, coffee chat, I th I'm not sure exactly how long after. It might be half an hour or uh, somebody says I'm quiet. It might be half an hour or an hour uh, after the coffee chat. Um, I'm not sure. I'm going to be releasing a puzzle for the Monero anniversary. It has multiple layers, and uh, the winners will be entered for a an interesting prize, but that uh, will not be announced until 24 hours after the puzzle is released. So we'll we'll see how that works out. Hopefully, people enjoy. It. All right, thank you so much, Need Money Ninety. Um, next, uh, Paul, can you introduce yourself for everyone here, please? Sure. Can you guys hear me? Okay. We can hear you and see you, so perfect. Okay, cool. It's not uh, there isn't too much background pop music going on or anything. Only so, small traces. We can definitely still hear you. Excellent. It's terrible, so I'm glad. Uh, my name's Paul. I'm the CEO at My Monero. Uh, we make very usable Monero wallet software for Monero, which luckily all of you are familiar with, so I don't have to go into the details of what it actually is. Um, I, uh, just by way of brief introduction, got into Monero through Bitcoin, actually. Found out about Bitcoin. Found out that uh, it seemed a little bit stagnant. Um, there was some interesting research going on around it, but it didn't seem like too much was able to be implemented in Bitcoin itself for some reason. Uh, so, yeah. I, oh, lo lovely. <laughs> I'm outside, as you guys uh, can infer. Yeah, we know that there's a apparent fire that's happening right in your building. <laughs> yeah, it's right here. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I found out about Monero. Uh, it looked to be very, very cool, and um, I noticed that there was no mobile application for it, and there apparently were some usability issues for just ordinary people with it. So, I started asking around what people would want to see in a mobile application, and then Fluffy Pony probably just got wind of 
my uh, inquiries and he said that if I want to work on a Monero wallet that I could start working on my Monero and the rest is history. So, oh, and uh, let me take this chance to say happy birthday to Monero. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us. It's, it, I'm, I'm really glad that this is a good time for you. We always mean to have you in all the coffee chats and yeah, totally. <laughs> we're, we're, we're just it's really crazy. happy. To have you. Yeah. Life gets crazy sometimes. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. And then uh, there's one other person that is joining us. I'm, I believe it's HYC. HYC, if it is you, can you speak up or if you're the other mysterious person on the channel, let us know who you are. Hey, yeah, this is HYC. Perfect. I guess correctly. <laughs> uh, yeah, so hello. Um, I'm kind of a networks and database guy, but uh, here I am. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering, does HYC also have pop music in the background, or is that still Paul? That's got to be. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there's there's no music playing here. Yeah, HYC likes to mix in pop music with his violin music. It's just, they go together so well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you have very strong opinions there. Uh, so if anyone has, you know, questions on some music opinions, that's, of course, a question and you should ask in the chat. I'm keeping a strong eye on it. So make sure to ask other questions. Otherwise, you're going to have to listen to me ask questions the whole time, which will be boring. But I'm I going to I have a question, start. Actually. Oh, you have a question, question in genetic. Go ahead. It's a quick question. And yes, my handle is endogenic for anyone who knows me by that handle. So um, how many people say HYC? How many people say hike? And how many people say high C? Personally, I say high C. I think it's cool. I mean, HYC is like the only way to say this name. It's it's cool. It's it flows well, in in my opinion. And like, if you've ever seen him, you're like, that's that that man is HYC right there. You know. I always What's said that? hick, hick like a hiccup. You know, it's a uh, it sounded fun. Yeah, I'm sure you meant like an hiccup there when you called someone hick. I'm sure that's exactly what it was. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly what I meant. HYC. There you are. Well, that's that's what I've always said because it's just you know it's just three initials. It's not a word. I don't have time for that. It. It's hick. <laughs> yeah. Again, thank you everyone for joining us. So, um, one question I want to start us off with. Um, there's a lot of people that are joining us. They might be watching this. Uh, and might not otherwise be very engaged in the community. They, they may have some interest in Monero, but aren't the people that are typically going to every every meeting and every sort of event that Monero is hosting uh, because we try to get this event out there. So um, I, I guess I can start with uh, Diego and then we can expand to others who want to, to address this topic. What are some ways that we can get sort of newcomers to get interested in helping. I know that Ricardo mentioned sort of the magic that was involved with Monero that got many of its original contributors interested in, in helping. How do we really keep this going as the community gets larger? This is uh, this is something that I, I've definitely given a lot of thought to, and I, I've been primarily responsible for the rollout of many of the work group uh, uh, what are they? What are they called? Resources such as the Mattermost, which connects to the IRC. It has a bridge to the IRC, um, and it's the open source, self-hosted version of Slack. So we uh, don't. We do have a Slack as well, but you know, after a certain amount of messages, they cut you off unless you pay per user. And so Mattermost is like, yeah, we have all of that, except we're not Slack, and we, you, you can have access to all those things in perpetuity. And also things like um, Taiga, which is you know kind of a an agile development tool where People, you know, Mineruyo has used it. The DEF CON people have used it to go ahead and uh, um, have a have an easier time kind of organizing their people and, and processing and, and tracking their development. And I think one of the biggest things that we can do to get people to volunteer is to reduce the barrier to entry as much as possible. Um, just so it, it's easy for people to either get connected to a work group that already exists or have the resources 
necessary to kind of launch their own work group. And a lot of people can get stuck. They're like, oh, I want to do this, but I, I don't know how I would organize people or I don't know how. And so that's the, like, you know, kind of where matter most and Taiga and these other things come in was like, okay, these things exist. If you want to do this, here's a platform for you to do it. And it's already up. It's already set up for you to, to do this type of thing. And I can help you through it. Um, so really um, lowering the barrier to entry of volunteering, because something like Monero, too often people are like, well, I don't code or I code in the wrong language. So, you know, I, I don't know how to contribute. Um, and, you know, people like Achoni have done a great job of trying to lower the barrier of entry for translators, uh, for the uh, core software and the GUI software, and maybe somewhere along the line for the uh, website as well. And it, it, it can be tough because a lot of this requires outside the box thinking. A lot of this requires, okay, I don't code. How can I help the Monero project? Um, and it depends on how much free time you have, how much passion you have. You know, sometimes if you're going to put a lot of time and effort towards this, you might want to get compensated for this, which is not necessarily a bad thing. And we have a system for that, the community crowdfunding system, but, uh, you know, that has its own strengths and weaknesses and, uh, a small barrier to entry in terms of reputation and trust of the individual in question that's putting up the proposal. So I, I think in, in my opinion, the way that we just continually get volunteers to come and get volunteers to stay is keeping the barrier of entry low and trying to keep morale high. I think people vastly underestimate the human component of open source projects. We forget that behind every computer screen is a human being and people like to be appreciated. People like to be included. People like to have, you know, uh, fun with each other. And, and if all we do is just come together and we just work on things and we go home and go to bed, well, this might, this might be a little bit more boring of a place to be. So, uh, making sure that everybody feels welcome, making sure that everybody you know, has a place here and is, uh, not just free to contribute how they wish, when they wish, for what reasons they wish, but also have the resources to do so at their fingertips where they don't have to work so hard to make that happen. Okay. Thanks Diego for setting the stage of saying that the Monero community needs to be accessible and open, be, be approachable for people to want to get uh, involved. Need Money Nander, are you still there? Uh, yeah, I am. What's up? Yeah, so so um, building off of that, um, what's the best way to get someone from the stage of I'm paying attention to Monero to I, I have a fun little project to work on? Do we, do we need to be open about these are these are nice little projects that you can work on. We need people to be making news content or, 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 or any other information. How do we sort of cross the barrier from someone who's just a Monero fan to I? I mean, I love Monero and I'm an active Monero contributor. Uh, so if if you're looking to actually contribute to the community, there's two different ways you could go about it. One is if you already have a pre predefined idea that you want to actually see created. In which case, I mean go for it or try and uh, find people who are interested in helping you with it. If you don't have a ton of experience in the community or uh, a lot of built up trust with the community members, you might find it difficult to find people who will work with you. Um, but that just means that you need to either do it on your own or uh, try and convince people. The other would be to contact either the Monero outreach work groups or any work group that has an association with something you're good at. It doesn't need to be code. I mean, code, you can go to Monero Dev, that's easy, uh, or open GitHub issues or start fixing things. Um, that's probably one of the lower barrier entry things. Um, the other stuff would be like if, you, if you're dual uh, bilingual uh, or trilingual or whatever, you can go to the localization work group and help us with our strings. Um, honestly, just get yourself situated in some of our chat channels. Uh, send a message to people, say, hello, this is what I'm good at, or I'm interested in helping out. And you'll find more than a couple people will speak up and tell you, hey, here's a couple of things that we actually need done. So yeah, that's. Um, I, this is going to be an open question I'm going to put out. Um, so when I generally tell people how they can get more knowledgeable and also to contribute to Monero, I generally refer them to the Monero Stack Exchange because they can read all the resources there. If there's a way for people to even start off by you know, improving the grammar or updating sort of the the uh, updating the answers so that they're relevant for for an update or, or whatever it might be. Do you think that that's a good approach, or do you think that it needs to be more more specific than that, or a, another pr approach entirely makes sense for most people? I, I think Stack Exchange, unless you're like pretty intimately familiar with the protocol, is going to be an exercise in futility. 
uh, a lot of comments that you'll make or responses that you'll put up will probably be either uh, less than the quality that's required for a Stack Exchange response or, uh, I mean, I mean it, if you're the kind of person who should be responding on Stack Exchange, you'll probably know who you are, but I, I don't think I would recommend a newcomer do that. Read up on answers there, sure. All right, so um, what's so, uh, Serang, uh, we, we sort of work together to help get newcomers involved by explaining things for people, or at least our, our intent is to sort of dummy down a lot of the content that's in the research paper into something that's at least a little bit more comprehensible. We did this for a, a bulletproof conversation where I had you on and interviewed you, and we spoke for, I don't know, maybe an hour and a half or so about what bulletproofs are and, in a way that is at least easier than reading a paper. Um, do you think that that's sort of good enough, or do you think we need to go an additional step to make it, you know, much, much more approachable for people, even if the intent isn't to go straight into the cryptography, but just to have a good working understanding about Monero so that they can overall contribute to it better? I mean, I think it's kind of a tough one, right? Because there's a whole lot of different things that go into Monero, um, and it's a lot of different pieces of math and cryptography that I mean, to really fully understand how the protocol works, you know, you've really got to grasp all of them. Um, you know, and, and to some extent, I think that, you know, there's a level where you can kind of talk about, oh, this is kind of what stealth addresses do on a very broad level. And this is kind of what Ring CT does. Um, but at a certain point, like you kind of hit a, you kind of hit a spot where, you know, you kind of have to go into the math a little bit. And I guess I like the fact that we have different levels of resources available. You know, we have Stack Exchange, which, you know, can be really good for specific questions that maybe don't need to get too technical, but can get technical if we need to. We have resources like Mastering Monero, which is great for kind of taking someone who has no idea what this is and kind of giving them kind of a first look at what it is. And then we have something like Zero to Monero, which is a great resource that I look forward to seeing updated that is kind of the closest thing we have to a protocol specification. Um, and... And I guess I like the idea of not necessarily having something that starts from the beginning and runs all the way down to the nuts and bolts, but you know, have, have something that's ready and available for people at whatever level that they're at. And I think the Bulletproof discussion was nice because you know, it, it, it went just deep enough, I think, to get people interested to where they could maybe go to read the paper if they were at that level or you know, maybe get just interested enough to go and read something like Zero to Monero, for example. So I guess I really like the idea of of just making very comprehensive resources available at whatever level our users might be at. All right, thanks, Ring. How do we, I mean, do we need people that already know a lot to, to make these resources? Or do you think that um, there's a way for people who are trying to learn more to sort of make it a, a research project that they do? Um, you know, I'm not really sure. Um, hmm. That's a very interesting question. You know, I mean, I would say anything that kind of involves like the base level math or the cryptography, you know, you've really got to be, you've really got to know your stuff to be able to contribute well there. Um, that being said, you know, I, I don't think that should scare anyone away from getting involved. Um, I mean, one thing that I've kind of, kind of at a broad level would like to see from the research side is for us to have more kind of small self-contained projects available to people who are, you know, who have, who are interested in Monero who have kind of particular areas of expertise that may not align with those of other folks in the research lab area or channels, um, but still want to be able to contribute to self-contained projects. Um, so I guess I'd like to see us become more, more accessible in that way from a research perspective. Um, but at the same time, I guess I also acknowledge the fact that, you know, being able to make kind of a comprehensive guide to something about Monero's protocols does require a certain level of knowledge already about those protocols. And I think to some extent that's kind of unavoidable. Arctic Mine, you really enjoy um, ex explaining um, Monero's scalability properties. I know you gave the talk at DEF CON that, that it was understandable by many people. So what was your approach for taking, you know, the, the complex issue of scaling? We, we've, we've seen uh, many debates within the Bitcoin community about how Bitcoin should address scaling, and there's a ton of disagreement there. How do you approach explaining such a complex topic for people, and, and what's, what's the purpose or what's your reasoning for, for really trying to do that? Well, th there's a couple of things. I mean, I actually got involved in Monero because of analyzing and studying scaling in Bitcoin. 
I mean, this was, I was literally um, running searches in Bitcoin talk regarding the scaling issues in Bitcoin. And I came in kind of post, I think it was on Risto Petilia about MRO, which used to be before, that's even before XMR came on. And I went into details of why this is just, 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 just mentioned, didn't mention what I was looking at. But at least at the time I had enough um, respect. I said, okay, I'm going to take a look at it in detail. And then I realized it addressed fundamentally all of the concerns that I had about scaling in Bitcoin. Now, from a point of view of getting people involved, my, if I've shared my own experience, I was brought into the community because of a particular field. And then I recognized it wasn't that it's sometimes you can just specialize in something, make it work, and then contribute back. Now, I spent a lot of time researching this in Bitcoin, primarily as an investor. I was looking at it from the perspective, is this thing a viable investment? And then I realized when it came, that Monero actually had the problem solved. And then it comes to the next stage where I said, well, okay, you have all this knowledge. Now I can contribute it back to the community. Are we having technical issues? I can Good. hear you, it's fine. Yeah, okay. Um, now, we could, and now I can use that to contribute back to the community. You know, my opinion is a very critical component, but it's one that hasn't really been explored by a lot of people. It's a lot of opportunity if you want to get into this field, by the way. Um, because it's sort of it's totally separate from the cryptography, uh, cryptography aspect that, for example, uh, Saran was talking about. I mean, you can apply a lot of the very same formulas to Another another uh, coin, such as, for example, um, Dogecoin or Bitcoin, but you, you have fundamental designs in the cryptocurrency that make it impossible. You, you, you need a tail emission, for example. And and so that's the, the, the element. The, the point that I'd like to get across, though, is that when you're looking at contributing to a project, if there's something you, you're really knowledgeable and passionate about, that's and especially if a lot of other people aren't into that area, then it makes a lot of sense for you to contribute in that field. So for me, it was kind of an opportunity. This is something I can do, I can specialize on, I can contribute to the project in. Um, and the fact that relatively few people are doing it is interesting because you, you try to complement what everybody else is doing. And that's kind of my feeling. The big focus for Monero is privacy, fungibility, and anonymity. I would take the point of view that Monero is uniquely positioned for, um, for on-chain scaling way ahead of any other coin. Uh, way ahead of Bitcoin, for example. Um, because of certain characteristics of Monero that make that possible. And that surprises people because a lot of people think, well, wait a minute, the scaling debate in Bitcoin. Well, the scaling debate in Bitcoin is uh, to a large degree driven by a lot of design flaws in Bitcoin itself, in my opinion which materializes then in these human conflicts, uh, social conflicts that we see. But yeah, but I think that's what I'm saying. So, so if there's something you're interested in, in aspect of a project, and especially if it's something that's not being looked at a lot by, any, by other uh, members of the community, that's a great opportunity to get involved. And you are, may actually be the pioneer, the person that actually is contributing where nobody else really has done a lot in that particular aspect of the project. That would be my, my sort of thought on the issue. And quite honestly, I'd love to see people learn more about blockchain scaling um, and the issues and the relationship to emission rates and the, and the relationship to fees um, and how all these things interact together. Um, it's quite a different aspect of the project from, say, a lot of the cryptography that we're working on. It is actually applicable to a lot of the projects, but it's very unique to Monero because Monero is very well positioned for that. So those are kind of thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you, Arctic Mine. Um, I'm going to switch to a very similar topic, just slightly different. So HYC, um, same major idea. You're looking for other contributors to participate in essentially reviewing and being a part of Random X's development. Now, for those who have never heard of Random X before or aren't very familiar with it, it is a proposed future proof of work algorithm for Monero with the intent to make it CPU friendly um, and ASIC uh, and ASIC resistant, so to speak, in, in the, the best way, the best approach that we know how. So I know that Howard, you're generally targeting individuals that 
are very technical and can have the ability to review this code. But how do you go about approaching people who aren't currently in the Monero ecosystem and encourage them, basically get them to actually become a part uh, of this project? Is that a difficult sell? Is that, is that an easy sell? What's your general process there? Uh, well, that's an interesting question because, you know, uh, when I first came up with random JS and it was just myself, um, you know, currently we have th three people working on random X and the other two people just came up out of nowhere. So just following their own curiosity. Uh, so I didn't actually have to go hunt for anybody at, you know, at, at, at the outset. Um, I'm not sure how they heard about it, but whatever they did hear about it, they saw it as an interesting problem, as an interesting technical challenge. And I suppose that's the same thing, you know, that kept me here myself, right? Um, you know, my own involvement in Monero has expanded over time be from originally just looking at the database aspect to looking at other things, such as the network communication and now the proof of work. Um, so it's just a matter of getting getting an idea in front of the right eyeballs, you know, the right people who just have that kind of curiosity and, and they're looking for a technical challenge that, you know, that ignites their interest. Um, now, so that, so that's one part of your question. You, uh, you also asked about how we find reviewers and that, you know, that's a completely different set. You know, we, we actually have, two professional software review teams now uh, putting proposals together for us. And before that, you know, I also went into a couple of hardware discussion forums that I kind of participate in on a regular basis. And I noted the idea there, said, hey, you know, we've got this design put together. Um, would any of you guys who are, you know, <clears throat> seasoned chip designers, uh, you know, give me some of your feedback on it? And it just went like that. Awesome. Um, one may, one concern I generally have um, is that things sort of seem to have fallen in place for Monero so far, at least in this one way. Monero has a, a really unique idea. It was, you know, perhaps the first cryptocurrency to really execute on the idea of having privacy on chain, and that drove some people together. I know that. Uh, Fluffy Pony spoke about how Monero's decision to use LMDB helped draw you in. And then we're, we've sort of gone there. Um, Monero's adaptive rock size helped draw Arctic Mine in. And so we've sort of, Monero's been able to attract talent sort of seemingly out of nowhere. So my concern is if Monero needs to continue attracting talent, to continue growing with the number of contributors, it, how can we really do that in a way that's that's better than just saying, well, we need to hope the right people show up at the right time? Or is that still kind of what we're in? That's a good question. But, you know, you know um, where did DSC come from, who's now working on the GUI? I, I don't how do you know. We, do you know, or is that just... Did, no, I, I don't know. How, how did we find him? You know, did, did somebody chase him down, or did he come to us on his own? I think he was around for a while in different capacities. Um, his availability increased or something. Like uh, Medusa says that he recruited DSC. Oh, okay. So, I mean, there's there's going to be this combination, right? You know, like, uh, for instance, uh, you know, Brandon recruited his, his buddy, and so we had the two of them in MRL. And so there's going to be a combination of, you know, luck and a and actual recruiting, right? I mean, that's that's just the way things would naturally unfold. I do want to say, though, um, it's all right that I speak out of turn here. That uh, I've heard of a number of people who have said that they they would normally be contributing to Monero, but the code base is too imposing, or they're not sure where to start. And I think that we could make some progress there for sure. Yeah. What, do you have any specific recommendations there? Oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, the code base is um, the code base itself could definitely be cleaned up. Uh, I would say that certain aspects of it are a little bit redundant, like some data structure declarations are a bit redundant. 
other aspects of it are well factored, like the core crypto stuff is pretty well done. Uh, but a lot of the stuff that approaches the business logic layers have been maintained by so many different people that uh, it's just become a little bit of a rat's nest. And that's the, that's the sort of area that you actually want people to be contributing at. Yeah, um, so, so that's the sort of thing that that is going to take probably some active recruitment. Um, you know, if you look at development that's going on now, we're still cranking on new features, and it would take uh, some dedicated time to, to, for instance, go through and insert meaningful comments in all of these places where no comments currently exist. You know to actually document the code base in a way that makes it friendlier for new developers to come on board. Um, that's, that's actually a, a, an in heavily involved development task. And, you know, right now we're focused on stabilizing and other new features and that sort of thing. So it, it's kind of a conflict that we would need new, new developers just to address that. I would, I would uh, suggest, though, that there's the relatively strong argument that code that's well enough factored will end up in functions and modules that are effectively named and organized such that they comment themselves, or at least not 100%, you know, right? Because sometimes there's some, um, uh, like, not, not clandestine, but, but like, you know, uh, non, non, not completely obvious. Uh, implementation detail or justification that is wrapped up in certain structures, certain code structures, but um, in, in those cases it makes sense to comment it, but uh, I tend to find that code that like really needs excessive commenting, there's, there's probably an architectural problem there. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. You know, I mean, for my, for my own experience, you know, I've, I've worked obviously in the database side, I've done some stuff in the RPC and the wallet, and you know, for the most part, I've just found what I needed to find and started working on it. So, um, well, you're a superstar. So, <laughs> thanks. But um, yeah, in, in any large code base, you know, the the way to to know where to find things is just to jump in and start reading. You know, it's, it's like it's yeah, like, it's true. It's like reading a book. How do you how do you get to understand what the story is inside this book? Well, you sit down and read it one page at a time and that's just what you do yeah thanks thanks Howard and uh, and Paul um, I'm gonna move back to Serang so Serang um, we spoke I mean the other two spoke about a developer perspective how to get more developers involved um, Serang when you're at a conference and you're speaking with people about Monero I know that you've been to academic conferences and you've been to less academic conferences or more educational or, or business focused conferences and you've had to speak with, with both sets of individuals about what you're doing with, with Monero. Um, have you had any success at speaking with them about Monero and then they later went to uh, become more actively involved? And what were, your, what were sort of the best ways that you reached out to these, these people? Um, so, so we've always had kind of, a, kind of an interesting relationship with academia, right? Um, you know, to some extent, you know, a lot of academics kind of go off and, and start companies in this space and kind of make their stuff proprietary. You know, some academics stay very, very strictly within the university system and do kind of the publication there. Um, but we have seen we have seen folks who've been really interested in Monero from an academic perspective and who appreciated the fact that it was so that it was so accessible from kind of a protocol perspective and that there was so much interesting thing, so many interesting things to do and work on and so many interesting open problems to solve that you know, they have kind of collaborated with MRL and, and with other Monero researchers, you know, to kind, of, to kind of suss out, you know, interesting details about the protocol and about things that we could be doing. Um, and I think in general, one thing that we've, we've been getting better at, and I want to continue getting better at, you know, is making good relationships within the academic space. Um, and that involves, you know, getting involved with folks who are working at universities, you know, and getting involved with other cryptographers who are working in other projects. You know, despite kind of the, the politics that, you know, some people seem to think exists kind of throughout all these projects, you know, a lot of cryptographers and mathematicians and researchers at other projects, you know, are surprisingly accessible and open to collaboration. Um, and, and I have enjoyed seeing that, and I want to keep seeing that get better. I don't think it really can. 
Yeah, thanks, Rank. Um, so binary fate, I'm gonna go back to you. So, so get, get ready here. Um, <laughs> so binary fate, um, you have built many applications on Monero. You've had the courage to build some of the first systems that Monero uh, community has really used, including XMR.2 and many other things. What really, what, why do you think that you sort or what gave you the motivation to really go out and start doing this? And what can we do to get other individuals to get out and build other things on top of Monero too, like you've done? Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. All right, uh, I struggle to hear the question um, because there's a lot of noise around here. We are having fun. Yeah, sorry uh, to interrupt your fun. <laughs> yeah. You're asking uh, how we can encourage people to actually build services and business on top of the Monero project, right? Yep, exactly. Okay. Um, I think there is two aspects to that. The first one is that you can cater to people that are interested to do something they are passionate about, or you know that uh, they are interested in the ethic, uh, ethic of it. Uh, and they want to build something that goes in the same direction as their hurt. Um, and you can get a good bunch of very valuable and capable people doing that. Um, and we actually see that very frequently in Monero. Uh, the second angle is that you, you try to be very, very factual and uh, rational. And you just explain that basically you need fungibility if you want to build businesses. Um, whether you want to receive um, money, basically, uh, cryptocurrency in the case of Monero, and uh, not be liable for some crazy shit that happened for from like to ownership down the line because of your customers uh, doing shady stuff. Or also you don't want to reveal um, your financial transaction as a business, which is a you know, fairly reasonable um, uh, demand or baseline for businesses in general. In a, you know, in a capital capitalist world, uh, businesses all you know fight in a mutually competitive environment, and you don't want to reveal information. You don't want to uh, let everyone know how much you pay to your uh, providers, to your to your you don't want to let everyone know how much you're investing in a new market. You don't want everyone to know how much you, you are getting from your customers and so on. And if you were to use something like Bitcoin, it's, it's like it goes very like, you know, head to head with the very basics of running a business. Uh, so then you can just explain everyone that uh, building something on top of Monero is just the equivalent of building a business that utilize cash or the traditional financial system, but in the blockchain domain. And if you want to do that in blockchain domain, there is really no alternative but Monero, I think that provides an equivalence in that your competitors are not going to look into your books. Uh, your customers are not going to be threatened because everyone can know that they are using your service and by how much and so on. So. Um, I think you can just explain people that what they took for granted in the like legacy traditional world that we have that we knew and have been accustomed to, you know, the usual financial system and, and the cash and fiat system, if they want to keep operating on the same premise but in the blockchain universe then there is no alternative but Monero. Otherwise, everything is just a step backwards and it's just very threatening to any business. Thanks, Binary Fit. So this is gonna be an open question uh, to really everyone. So, so Apple recently started an advertising campaign. This has nothing to do with your, what you think of Apple, um, but they have a campaign based off the idea of privacy matters. They show, um, images, uh, videos of individuals that are trying to protect privacy in everyday life. And then they say, if privacy matters to you in your normal life, it should matter to the phone that, that your life is on, is, is basically their marketing campaign. And 
I promise I don't work for Apple. I'm not trying to promote their products, but is there something that the Monero community can learn from this advertising campaign in terms of getting people excited about the idea of using Monero and the idea of their of really protecting their privacy? Because generally at the moment, we write privacy off as something that most people sort of don't really care about or something that's really low on their list of actual priorities based off how they interact. So is this, for, from this ad campaign, is there something that we can learn, can we learn from this in terms of getting the word of Monero out there? Why are we not? Yeah, I could chime in on that. So I think that one of the reasons that Apple's message uh, has some weight to it or the reason that people are really paying attention to it Dig, are you busting a busting a jam to that pop music? Nice. So yeah, um, you know it. Hell yeah. So like, I think that the reason why it has some weight to it is that Apple is already influential uh, from a usability standpoint. A lot of people are using their products, and a lot of people are therefore paying attention to them. And one of the things that I've noticed with Monero is that uh, you don't really get a ton of people using uh, technologies that are not really that usable. And so I think that we could do a lot more to improve the reach of Monero, first, first of all, by improving its usability, which is something that Diego touched upon. I would love to see uh, someone show up and add a, a My Monero iOS plugin for Apple Messages, for example, so that they could send Monero through Apple Messages or an Apple Watch uh, extension for the My Monero iOS application. Because, you know, the more the more usable and the more integrated these things are with people's ordinary lives, the more that people are going to start to realize that privacy is not something that uh, that's out of their reach. Um, and aside from that, I think that from a marketing standpoint, we can probably start to convince people a bit more effectively by telling them, by, by, by making it clear that this information that they expose uh, in non-private manners can get stored forever and revealed by any disinterested party at the drop of a hat, you know, simply because those, you know, for example, corporations that are storing all of our information, they, they just don't care and they're not really being held accountable. So um, if we show examples of like catastrophes that have happened or the potential for that kind of thing to happen, and then we show people how easy it is, um, I think that could be effective. Um, I would um, kind of like to make a comment on this, and I think that one of the comments that I would make about Monero is that before you can even consider, before you can even worry whether a transaction is fungible or not a private, you, you have to be able to transact. So it's actually a very basic element. Um, if you want to uh, compare Bitcoin's uh, short mis shortcomings, there are two shortcomings. Um, one of them is the lack of fungibility. And the other one is the lack of being able to scale. They lack to be able to transact. Now, in the early Bitcoin, of course, assume that Bitcoin actually had addressed these problems, when in fact it hadn't. I mean, the, the one megabyte block limit was something that was added to Bitcoin about 18 months afterwards in, in, in 2010. And at the time, fairly early on, it was assumed that the sort of pseudo anonymity that uh, the Bitcoin transaction provided by decoupling the the address from the from the identity of a person was enough to ensure fungibility and privacy, which in fact both have been proven incorrect. Um, so my comment on this is that if we're going to, is that we, I think we have to look at scaling also as an issue, as something that Monero has addressed. Uh, the second thing I'd like to say is that excellence attracts excellence, and that goes a bit to the previous question, and that is if you, for example, make it more usable, well, that's going to attract people to, to Monero just by that fact. I mean, that's an example. If you improve the quality of the code, then that's going to attract developers because they're going to find it easier to understand the code. Uh, and, and you can think of many examples of that, but the mere fact that you improve the the Monero as a, as a currency is actually going to attract that extra level of interest, of expertise, whether it's individuals, users, or whether it's developers, or whether it's contributors. And there is an element of excellence that attracts excellence. There's just not luck that we're getting people. We're getting people because we're doing things right. And I think that's an important thing to recognize. Now, come back to the Apple question. Apple, I think, is feeding on 
well-known concerns about privacy, particularly relating to, to Facebook, uh, to the whole scandals around privacy. There's an awareness of privacy in, in the digital world now that wasn't the case even two years ago. Uh, and then you're basically capitalizing on it. So I think the lesson for us is it's an opportunity for us in the sense that uh, there is a lot more awareness about privacy and fungibility uh, now than there was even like uh, a while back. And I think that's a lesson, I think, from that uh, marketing campaign of Apple is that they recognize that this is something to sell and they're selling it. Uh, and that, I think, would be the lesson that I would suggest is important for Monero there. So is that like a beacon of hope for Monero that the idea of privacy isn't, you know, a foregone conclusion or, or just completely discarded by most people? If we have a, a large U.S. company that is that is marketing this specifically to people, is that a good sign to say that there are people that still care about this and they're willing to to use applications that prioritize this? I would go further than that. I mean, I would say that there's been a, a, an enhanced awareness of privacy in a relatively last year to, to two years. Uh, and obviously that's going to be very powerful for Monero, but Apple is responding to a trend. Large corporations like that tend to respond to trends. So, so they look at what's happening in the marketplace and they say, okay, this is an angle for us. We can position ourselves in this uh, element and say, we're going to do about privacy. They, they're looking at a trend and then they're going to position into that trend. So that's, but the change, it's been a relatively uh, short change. I would say probably in the last uh, 18 months, two year range, particularly I would say regarding a lot of the data leak scandals and so on. I mean, we can focus on things such as, for example, identity theft. That you have simply when you, when you use a credit card with a merchant, the merchant gets hacked. And now your financial situation is compromised. You have zero control about this. Um, and that's a major flaw in the in the uh, uh, in the fiat system because it's a pole system. And with something like Monero, you transfer your funds and you avoid the hack. Now that's even true of other cryptocurrencies. But I also want to come back to another point, and that is that Monero does something else in privacy, and something very critical, and that's on chain scaling. And that really hurt Bitcoin. I mean, you saw it even before. I mean, I remember in two thousand and thirteen buying a meal at a restaurant paying with bitcoin it's not possible to do that today um buying an item from a store that was maybe like two to three dollars us in fact I, the specific item that i bought from a store in vancouver was actually um, a cable for a five and a quarter inch floppy disk of all things and i paid for it with bitcoin and and the, and the thing was like about two dollars there's no way you can do that today with bitcoin because the, the transaction fee will just swamp the thing. So there's lessons. I think the second lesson for Monero is overall is that we also have the scalability, ability to transact on it. But yes, I mean, I say there's a trend towards awareness of privacy right now. And that's what Apple has responded to. Okay. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Go ahead, Ted Howard. Yeah, I, I just uh, reiterating what uh, Arctic Mind was saying. Um, Apple is not setting a trend, but they are certainly responding to something, and that's good. For, good for us because they're reinforcing this message, and you know, privacy is one of our core messages. Yeah, so that's great. Um, we might be able to ride on their coattails, you know, ride that wave, uh, but you know, it, it still still seems strange to me to say that a currency needs marketing. Right, you know, dollars don't need marketing, euros don't need marketing, Swiss francs don't need marketing. So, so that whole question is a little bit odd about um, raising awareness and and uh, advertising, you know, selling points basically. But that's that's kind of the position we're in of what we need to do. It just feels like an odd position to be. I, I agree that it feels odd and you look at all these other fiat systems and you see that they don't need marketing necessarily, but that's because they have something else. They have deadly force behind them. <laughs> uh, the government is like, yeah, you're going to use this. You're going to go to prison. And that's just the way that it is. And Monero doesn't have deadly force. Monero doesn't want deadly force. So in the place of compulsion for using 
uh, Monero. We have to have something else. Otherwise, people aren't going to know that it exists. People aren't going to know that it uses it. Um, so you're right. The U.S. dollar doesn't need marketing in the traditional sense that we think of businesses marketing themselves. The marketing is the government, and that's the best marketing of all. And not, so we don't want Monero to have the government involved or compulsion involved or any of these things involved. So we need something else. Is it marketing in the traditional business sense? I don't know. But it has to be something else somehow, somewhere because we just we lack that part of fiat currencies and it's something that uh that they really benefit from in terms of awareness but yeah just you know i i thought the apple privacy ad was very well done and the message that they're sending is almost you know that could be exactly the same message that we've been sending you know and especially when people ask you well why the heck do you need a privacy coin i mean that's everything in the apple ad works to answer that question it's good to pay attention to that i mean they are the wealthiest company in the world right now right so yeah yeah and i would i would just this is xmr scott i would chime in a little bit on that the apple thing as well like it's incredibly important that like because we're arguably to a certain degree like competing systems for payment right you can either pay with monero or you can pay with like apple's credit card and apple is kind of arguably to a certain degree lying or telling a like white lie when they say you know apple doesn't know what you're purchasing and so forth apple doesn't but goldman sachs and i forget what the payment processor was if it was visa or mastercard but they very much know those details so it's kind of like sure apple is kind of like marketing this privacy slant of you know they don't know anything but there are people within kind of that system that do and so they're sort of selling this false sense of privacy, in my opinion. So we have to kind of, as a community, sort of fight against this false sense of privacy, whether it's companies like Apple or kind of like scam coins like Verge or, you know, take your pick. Um, education, a, a kind of an aggressive education almost is very much important, I think. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for joining us, Scott. I know you can only make it the last few minutes, so we're, we're really have glad to have you. Uh, sorry, uh, you, we weren't able to go to the full introductions. Um, so uh, we're we're a little over time, so I'm going to begin wrapping up the coffee chat session. So Diego has plenty of time to speak about his very 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 important topic. Is there any any last piece of information that any of the contributors would like to get across um, besides? you know, happy anniversary to Monero. I'm, I'm opening a bottle of 2014 Barolo. Yeah, I, uh, I don't have the same pleasure, so I'm a little jealous, but um, enjoy. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you, Jer uh, binary fate. Uh, Jeremy is fine. I mean, you can call me like that in real life. <laughs> Um, yeah, just just um, maybe my, my last words, if you want to wrap up after that, but taking a, like a helicopter view on, you know, uh, also a scale like uh, of my life, like, um, you know, we, we are living in, uh, in times where the, the technological progress is so quick that uh, we can't keep up in terms of education. Um, I remember like I got internet when I was, I think 16. And I'm so glad that I'm of the generation that actually knew what, it, what the world was before internet. And then I saw it coming. So I'm very, very thankful to actually live in the generation I'm, I'm living. Um, but what we are seeing today, I think, is, is generally uh, w the world is like changing so quickly and in like direction that are radically antagonist. So on the one hand, we have Facebook, Google, all these companies that are very data oriented, selling data. And at the same time, we have technology that is incredibly empowering, like we have GPG, um, asymmetric asymmetric encryption was uh, invented in the 70s, but was not useful until we had emails for everyone in the 90s. And now, nowadays, we actually have tools in our hands to 
do crazy things in terms of communi communicating securely, um, to do a whole bunch of things that we couldn't do before in terms of interaction and protecting our privacy. And at the same time, the world is going like wild on, you know, the opposite. So I think it, it, it's it's very, very, um, it, it's an interesting time in general to be alive. Uh, no pun intended, but I'm thankful for today, even though I'm not thankful for today. Um, but uh, yeah, to wrap up, I, I would say that in, in those times where the, the world is like really pulling itself apart so quickly uh, between these different um, forces of economic interest versus what we can actually do all of us like every day in terms of technology, like use GPG is like super basic. And, uh, and since uh, 10 years, we can even exchange value in a secure manner with Bitcoin. And now since like, five years, we can exchange value in a secure manner that is also private. So it's so empowering and it's so going against what is the momentum in general. Um, so it, it's, 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 these are crazy times, but these are very, very interesting times. But what makes me optimistic is that I remember that Monero started with just a handful or just a very small group of people that were aligned on what they wanted to achieve. And when I see where we stand today after five years, honestly, mm. yes, it's still a small project. Uh, yes, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, it has, you can criticize that a lot, but what we achieved in five years makes me very optimistic in what we can achieve in the future in that world that is very, very right now critical because of the technology outpacing the education of most people actually involved in using the technology. So uh, just looking at what we achieved and what we are doing like tonight uh, makes me optimistic of what we will do next. Uh, so we'd like just to uh, finish on a positive note that uh, I'm, I'm, makes me personally very, very enthusiastic about the next year to come because there are people that are willing to fight uh, there are people that are willing to educate others. Um, there are people that are willing to put their fingers on what actually matters. Um, and uh, yeah, I love that. And I love you all for taking part. Thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> maybe just a tiny little <clears throat> side note also from our side. I mean, We've been all hosting this whole day of uh, Monero five year ex uh, anniversary experience and it's really a fun time and we've been recapping the last few years, you know, Justin, you've been here in our space and maybe all these viewers of the stream can't really see it, but it's in a tremendous place for people to gather. Jeremy's, Jeremy's here, like uh, Parasef has been contributing tonight and we've had this full day of Monero experience, like really thinking what's been happening. And, was C3 like in, in Leipzig the last couple of years, like we met uh, Fluffy Pony there like in the early days. And it's it's really, a, it's a movement, it's a community and it's friends actually happening to meet each other in real life and discussing all these um, specific intrinsic values that the communi community actually brings into place. And that's what I'm really, really uh, thankful for. You know, it's like people, intelligent people meeting each other and discussing actual topics that are really so important <clears throat> for everyone in, uh, in the future, you know. It's about fungibility, it's about privacy by default, that's what I'm saying. And it's, it's great that everyone gets together and gathers not only for the fifth anniversary, but for the 10th anniversary to come. And it's great that everyone was participating tonight. So it was really cool. And we will keep on working on that and we have our research part to it. And um, I don't know, maybe Paras, if you also want to join in for a second. Yeah, yeah. I just um, really want to say thank you to everyone who was participating today. Not everyone only was um, today at the um, taking part of this uh, live stream, but also at everyone who was not maybe um, 
voicing uh, their concerns uh, now because there's a lot of people who, who want to stay in the shadows or who don't want to mm. be maybe so active but there's a there's a lot of people who I uh, think um, are big, uh, maybe um, participating in this whole thing and I think it's um, very important to um, and I'm also very grateful to be part of this um, community I think we we achieved a lot in the past years and I think we will achieve so much more in the in the next years um, privacy um, will be a so important topic in the next years. Um, there's a lot of um, um, things we have to take. There's a lot of things that um, are changing um, and the whole um, debate is also changing. We see a lot of um, um, attacks on our uh, privacy uh, context and we see that privacy is at stake, especially in the European Union where um, we see that a lot of um, things are, or a lot of uh, privacy rights are actually uh, taken from people. Um, sometimes, like really fast, and, and we have to somehow um, regain this kind of privacy. And I think that like private currency is, a, is still a very strong topic that we have to somehow um, um, demonize. We see this in, in in Bitcoin, and we see um, in a way there's a lot of people um, demonizing and talking about that Bitcoin somehow did exactly the opposite to what we try to achieve with, with, with Monero in mm, a way. Totally. So there's, uh, there's a lot of, um, um, there's this kind of uh, um, ongoing debate about like this uh, privacy versus tr transparency uh, um, thing that is like actually happening. So we have um, in a way the situation that Bitcoin created the most um, uh, transparent uh, kind of financial transaction situation that we have right now. So basically everyone is super transparent. So um, we have to think about, is that what we want as a society? Is that, mm. is that something that actually brings us forward? In the end, this, this becomes like super political to some sense as well. Yeah. Because if we see um, the whole uh, Brexit debate as a kind of a financial privacy debate as well, um, um, this shows us, that, shows us that, that the whole world is actually um, um, in a way not so, not so easy. And we see that actually Cryptocurrency, in a way, just replicates this kind of space that we have, uh, or this kind of political situation, the political condition that we have already. And we have to see, um, and we have to ask ourselves, um, um, do we want to um, um, really commit to this kind of transparent society right now? And um, there's a lot of um, uh, things that we have, we, we can actually um, target this kind of questions. That's, for example, the situation that um, a lot of um, situations, especially in the European Union, um, and a lot of like legal uh, constitutions are like that, that um, legally specific states can basically survey you. Um, there's a lot of attempts to conquer that. There's, for example, actually, even from a harder perspective, um, 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 attempts to conquer mm. that. There's, for example, the Librem um, um, hardware approach. There's a lot of different things we have to basically look into. And um, we have to also teach people how to regain their privacy. I think this yeah. is a major yeah. um, thing that, that we also, as a, uh, I mean, uh, me personally as a, as a person, but also as an institute as right, we are actively tackling totally. that and trying yeah. to basically um, communicate that to the wider masses. But um, in, in a way, it's always um, um, this kind of um, question of like, what do we want to achieve with that? Are we basically um, um, in a way, um, fighting this war against terrorism all this kind of kind of uh, like blunt uh, um, stories that are told in order to to keep away or like like to to, to in in a way like um, actually make it like more complicated for for, for us for, for like people who are like uh, privacy preserving who are like um, um, maybe coming from the cyberpunk movement and like trying to to to, to make sure that people can regain their, their privacy hmm. uh, I, actually having a hard time to, to, to do that and like to, to convey that to people because um, there's this kind of ongoing like war against terrorism and this kind of shit. And, and while privacy um, is important, also terrorism has to be stopped, of course, yeah. But we, we cannot actually, um, um, uh, in a way, give up so many of our rights. This is insane. We, we have been fighting for so many things. Looking at the internet, basically um, a lot of things that we have been fighting against and a lot of things we, we, we got with the internet have been um, in a way revoked and last insane. We have to somehow regain this kind of um, um, privacy. We, we, we know how to regain and we have to actually make sure that these this kind of technologies are available to people. It's insane that with, with Bitcoin somehow the opposite is like happening. 
we have mm. to somehow fight for this kind of Definitely. momentum that we, we have uh, mm. these kind of situations um, happening again. Okay, go, go. Uh, so um, I think to summarize education, and we are the forerunners, maybe we are more aware um, than the masses of uh, what is going to be probably considered a human fundamental rights very soon, like financial privacy and so on. Mm. I think we, we will finish on that uh, from our side. Back to you, Justin. Okay, thank you all three of you for participating. And of course, thank you so much to, you know, Binary Fate, HYC, Need Money 90, Arctic Mine, XMR Scott, um, Serang, Endogenic, and anyone else that I missed that participated in the coffee chat. Of course, Riru, he's up next with the important event. So